Hi, everyone. Welcome to the LinkedIn Speaker Series. Whether you're here in the room or joining us on the stream, thanks so much for spending time with us today. I'm Rochelle Diamond. I'm on our employee experience team here at LinkedIn. And I run our speaker series, which is all about bringing inspiring ideas and innovative thinkers to our employees and our members to make you all more productive and successful. And if you've been coming to these, you know I like to always plug where you can see all the past speakers. If you go to speakers.linkedin.com, all of the past speaker events we've done are there. And you can also check out our iTunes account, um, or, or get a podcast on our iTunes account. You can do that as well. So today is no exception. We have a very inspiring speaker, innovative thinker, Fred Kaufman here with us today. I'm very personally excited to be able to introduce him. I met Fred almost five years ago when I actually started running the speaker series program. He was one of my very first guests that we had at LinkedIn. So this is a very nostalgic moment for us. I'm so excited that he's here with us today. So Fred, um, that talk that he did was called Your Job is Not Your Job, and it's still on speakers.linkedin.com, and I just checked, and it's, uh, it's been viewed over 65,000 times, so it's very popular, so I recommend you go check that out. Um, after that talk, actually, Fred joined us at LinkedIn as the VP of Executive Development and served as an invaluable resource for our executives as a coach, as well as many other employees. He also created the learning and development program called Conscious Business, which was based on his book by the same title. So if you're here at LinkedIn and haven't had a chance to take that course, I highly recommend it. And if you don't work at LinkedIn, some of that content has been packaged and is on LinkedIn Learning as well. So you can benefit from that as well there. So today, Fred is here to talk to us about his new book called The Meaning Revolution. It's hot off the presses. It literally came out this week. So we get to get it you know, right fresh off the presses. And um, this book is all about how meaning is so important in our work and in our lives, how salary and benefits are definitely a component of an employee's satisfaction and engagement, but it's much more than that. And he talks about how um, we can be really intentional about our time on this planet and doing something that's larger, you know, serves a larger purpose than just ourselves and live a truly heroic life. So I'm really looking forward to learning more about that. And we're very lucky that we have Reed Hoffman here today to interview Fred. It's very appropriate that he's here today too because as most of you know, um, we are celebrating our 15th anniversary this week. LinkedIn was founded 15 years ago, actually tomorrow, on Cinco de Mayo. So we're very grateful to Reed and the co-founders for founding this amazing company, which is doing incredible things in the world and is also an amazing place to work. And we're literally all here today because of them. So a lot of uh, gratitude and thanks to them as well. So we've got an exciting discussion today. And I, with all of that, I would love to welcome to the stage Fred Kaufman and Reed Hoffman. Actually, we uh, launched May 5th, uh, 15 years ago. So one day, it'll be the 15th anniversary of the launch. Mm. Um, it's with great delight I'm here. Hopefully, this is having a slight weird feedback. Hopefully, that will be corrected. Because um, uh, uh, Fred is, as I described, you'll see from the books on, the, on, the, um, on your chairs, I actually wrote uh, a brief forward. And in that forward, I call Fred the high priest of capitalism. And actually, when you read the book, you'll understand why. I also recommend his other book to you, Conscious Business, because it's uh, the practice of business as a spiritual practice, the practice of business as a meaningful practice about having that mission uh, and in being in service to that mission. Uh, but let's start with something a little bit more humanizing, uh, which is a kind of a classic LinkedIn you know, kind of welcome, which is something that's not in your profile? Um, well, I'll choose a story that a friend of yours uh, saved my life unbeknownst to him. Um, it turns out somebody sent me a video from Admiral McRaven um, 
it's famous for the first part that says, if you want to change the world, uh, first make your bed. Uh, it's a commencement speech. But later in that commencement speech, he says, he talks the story about the seals swimming uh, for their graduation uh, between sharks. And he says that if any shark gets close to you, don't be afraid, just stand your ground and go fight with the shark. Well, I was spear fishing, and uh, a shark came for me, uh, actually came for my barracuda, and it got pretty aggressive. Uh, that shark had scared uh, my wife and my sailor the day before and bit the, uh, a sling that my sailor had and actually took it away. So I was a little worried, but I remember that video and I w went and poked the shark and then it left and it left me alone. <laughs> uh, so then I thought, oh, this is really cool. So I took a picture of the head of the barracuda, the rest the shark had eaten, and I sent it to, to Reed and told him the story. I said, oh, you want me to forward your email to Admiral McRaven? It's like, what, do you know him? Yeah, yeah, we're together in some committee or something. So he sent the picture and the and McRaven sent, cool. So that's, yes, exactly. that's not in my LinkedIn profile. Yes. And just by the way, for full entertainment, uh, Admiral McRaven was the admiral in charge of the, uh, on the whole hierarchy of command of SEAL Team 6, which went in uh, for Osama bin Laden. That, that gives you the whole arc of these folks. Um, so back to the book. Uh, let's start with, do you view this book as the natural evolution of conscious business, your previous book? No, um, I would say conscious business was about uh, the practice of management and leadership and how people work better together. This book is the end of my love affair with a problem that lasted 30 years and I couldn't solve. And finally I declared defeat and said it's unsolvable. But that, that's, that's good enough to write a book about the unsolvable problem and how to manage it better. So this, this is the book on how to manage what I consider a tremendous dilemma of humanity at multiple levels. And it, it does build on some of the tools of conscious business, but it's much more philosophical. So let's go into the unsolvable problem. What is that? Well, the unsolvable problem is that to, to win, so to speak, we have to play for the team. You know, everybody, like if we are working at, at LinkedIn, we, we have to contribute to the mission. That's, that's our job. My, my first talk was your job is not your job because everybody believes that, oh, if I'm in engineering, I code, and if I'm in accounting, I prepare the reports. But actually, everybody's job is to help LinkedIn accomplish its mission. In general, every player's job is to help the team win. But we are self-interested. So each person would like to do the best for him or herself, particularly if we are measured by local performance metrics and how we look and our promotions and bonuses and career opportunities depend on these OKRs or KPIs that will describe how apparently we're doing, but it's not true because the real value is the contribution, but that contribution cannot be easily measured. As Einstein said, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. And this is the, the dilemma that what can be counted doesn't really count and what counts can't be counted. So we count what can be counted and then people <laughs> respond to that and they do things that hurt the team. Mm -hmm. And what, what is it about the problem that you think makes it particularly ultimately not guaranteed solvable? No, I guarantee it's not solvable because yeah. it's a mathematical problem. It's not, it's not that people are not nice to one another. So this is not a psychological problem. It's very similar to uh, the dilemma between quantum physics and relativity. If you look at the universe macro, uh, like Einstein did, then you can explain gravitational forces through the curvature of space. Now, you take those equations and you bring them to inside the atom and they blow up. They, they just give you contradictions all over the place. You take the atom and you look at the particles and say, oh, quantum mechanics is pretty good. It, it's incredibly predictive and it explains everything. You try to extrapolate it to analyze the universe and it blows up. So this, these two theories give you the contradictory equations to describe the phenomena. Well, in economics or organizational theory, the macro theory says to optimize the system, you have to sub-optimize the subsystems. So you have to measure people really by their contribution to the optimization of the system as a whole, work for the mission. Then micro theory tells if you're dealing with self-interested agents, you have to evaluate them 
on their local performance metrics. Otherwise, they're going to free ride, or they'll prey upon others, or they are just not good enough, and you'll never know who are the good players and who are the bad players. So you measure them on what they do, their KPIs. Uh, and that's okay for micro, but of course that leads people to not optimize the macro. So you see, it's, it's very analogous, the, the, the contradiction between one and the other, and there's no way to solve it. I mean, literally, uh, unless you change the parameters of the problem, which is what people are doing with super string theory in, um, in, in physics, there's no way to integrate an organization. And that's, that's why I called it the meaning revolution, because perhaps a little grandiose, but it's my, my admiration for Thomas Kuhn, and the history of scientific revolution saying, we cannot solve this problem without a paradigm shift. And it will require a revolution where something that's non-material, like meaning, now comes into the picture and can help us perhaps integrate at a higher level a problem that just purely mathematical um, contradiction cannot be solved. So let's go into the meaning revolution. What is the nature of that paradigm shift? Yeah. when when we say people are self-interested, we have a mental model of what self-interest means. And it's a fairly poor pro model of humanity because it says, essentially, it's the first stage of Maslow's pyramid. I mean, and, and then it stops there. It's like, well, once, you know, once you have enough food, well, you want more food. And once you have more food, well, maybe you want a better shelter. And then you want a bigger house and more cars and more goods. And you know, a, up to a certain point, that's true, but then there's decreasing marginal utility. You know, your, your seventh car doesn't give you as much satisfaction as your first. But we still think like that. That's that the only way to compensate people is with money or benefits or the promise of money and benefits through career in the future. And that, that, is, that is not wrong, but it's poor. It's, it's just only a, a, a small part of what people care about. So I wanted to go back and say, what is it that people really care about, especially after they fulfill these basic needs? And you know, building on Maslow, but uh, the, the higher pinnacle, or, or the pinnacle of this hierarchy is self-transcendence. It's going through achievement to actualization and then trans going, going beyond yourself. I said, why, why can't we explore that concern in a business arena. Why, why only talk about material goods? The people I met at LinkedIn and many other companies that I work over the years, nobody says, I want to be here because I get well paid. Because they could get well paid in many other places, some places even better. And very rarely, people will trade at this level, like we are, that they will trade, let's say, 20% uh, more money for 20% worse worse uh, work conditions, or a place where people backstab each other, or where there's no sense of community, or the mission is uh, shameful, like you know, getting people addicted to, to do something that will harm them. So the meaning revolution is about seriously considering how meaning, or what I call moral goods, um, community, uh, a sense of pride in the values that you express day in and day out, can also become a tremendous encouragement for people to participate. And those goods have something very special. Even from a technical economic standpoint, they're called club goods because they're, the, a private good is exclusive in consumption. So if there's a bonus pool, if you get more bonus, I get less. Uh, but if we're talking about the pride because we are an ethical company, you feeling proud doesn't take anything away from On the contrary, now we're a community and it's synergistic. We, we both feel proud and I, I'm actually proud to be in the company with you. And I hope you're, you're proud to be in the company with me and so on and so forth. And we, we build, it's like, wow, we're really cool. And I, I feel so, like, so enriched in my life by my connection with LinkedIn. There's no money in the world that would say, okay, drop that, and then we'll pay you twice as much, but you know, we're going to yell at you, mistreat you. Uh, you, you will never say where you work for because you'll be ashamed of that, and so on and so forth. So that, if we take it seriously, that solves the apparently unsolvable problem, but it requires a paradigm shift about what people really care. And by the way, now you see why I refer to Fred as the high priest of capitalism. If you hadn't quite made that <laughs> jump in connection yet. Um, so one of the things you describe in the book as part of this meaning revolution is a leader has no followers. What does that mean? Obviously, as a sentence, it, it, and we're going to go through a couple of your sentences that apparently seem like oxymorons, right? but have deep meaning to them. 
Well, I like looking like a moron. Oxymoron. It's <laughs> oh, different. Oh, oh, oh. An, <laughs> it's oxygenated, an oxymoron is an ox oxygenated moron. Yes. <laughs> um, well, what I mean by a true leader is a leader that inspires people to give their best. And what's truly best, I, I call it the soul. You cannot surrender your soul to another human being. I, I, I'm a little bit of an anarchist. You know, I, I just don't like authority that much in, in that respect. So if someone says, you have to give me your best, me, I say, no way. I, I, don't, I don't give my best to another person. Power corrupts. And getting someone else's soul is very bad for the person giving it away and very bad for the person receiving it. Because it's like the, the ring of Tolkien. It will corrupt the soul of the person that takes ownership of another person's soul. Now multiply that by 10,000. I don't even want to be close to that kind of, um, I don't know, witch's brew that, that can be created. And that's what cultism uh, ultimately does. So the only fair, safe, and possible surrender is to a mission that makes life great and that serves other human beings. So I, I, I had this tremendous experience when, when I, was, I was going to join LinkedIn as an employee. I haven't been an employee since MIT after you know, 20 years being wild out there in the marketplace as a consultant. And when Jeff invited me to join, I was like, oh, you know, I, I feel a little hesitant. Uh, you know, I have to give my freedom. Well, he convinced me and said, okay, Jeff, I'll work for you. And immediately Jeff said, no, don't work for me, work for the mission. And that was such a profound moment for me that, that um, it really made me rethink how I felt about committing to a mission, not to a person. And then that, that unfolded. It's true, that, that, that's the story out of which came this concept that a true leader has no followers because a true leader doesn't say, follow me. A true leader says, join me and we'll follow a mission. So the leader is the first follower. And the so-called followers are the second or third followers. But we're all in the mission. And in a sense, I see Jeff or you running a little faster than I am in the race. But I'm not chasing you. I'm, I'm going where you're going. And I say, well, these guys are showing me the way. And then I'm, it looks like I'm following you, just like it would look like the second or third runner is following, are following the first. But that's not true. They're not following the first. They're going, they're going to the goal. And the goal, at least the one I, I, I discovered in LinkedIn, was so inspiring that I would give everything. I would give my soul for that goal. And I sell, I sell my soul, but I don't sell my soul to any human being. I sell my soul for the sake of creating the conditions where the world's professionals can be more productive and successful and grow in consciousness. And I would say you commit your soul, you don't sell it. Right. Exactly, I commit. Yes. Yeah, exactly, it's, it's the commitment, yes. and that is infinite. I mean, it, it transcends any barrier. Um, it's a life. It's, it's a life commitment. So I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I treasure our friendship, mm -hmm. and it has absolutely nothing to do with the form that the world takes. It's we're we're on that path, and we're comrades in that mission. And I feel like that about every person that is in that path too, yep. whether in LinkedIn, outside LinkedIn, and there may be people in LinkedIn that are working for paychecks. And that makes them less of a comrade in that mission than people who are outside of LinkedIn, but they are aligned and we're in the same, yeah. the same race, so to speak. And this is a good place to actually get to the uh, second surprising oxymoron, um, which is die before you die. Yes. Well, um, I mean, I like to ask people if you had like, time for one more phone call now, like right now. Who would you call? Don't answer, but just think for a minute. Who would you call? And what would you tell this person? Now, what are you waiting for? Because when you have one more phone call, you may not know. You know, the, the one minute before the accident, you may not know. Now, the good news is that we're not, hopefully, <laughs> we have a little more than a minute <laughs> yes. now. Um, but the cool consideration of death like asking yourselves that question. While you're still alive and having the chance to do something about it is what makes life precious, vibrant. There's a principle in economics that is value is dependent on scarcity. When you think your life is infinite, well, you can do it tomorrow or next year or in a thousand years. What's the rush? But when you realize you may not have tomorrow, what are you doing today? 
how, how are you living today? And it is, it is a way, it's, it's, it's a warrior's way to live. Like every moment could be your last. And when every moment could be your last, you have no time for bullshit. And it's not just bullshit. What I mean by bullshit is not what you do, but it's how you do whatever you do. So probably if someone said, Fred, you have three minutes to live, I wouldn't stay on stage. I would go, you know, call, do, do, do my call. But barring the, the change in what, how I am on stage and how we're having this conversation, I think it's beautiful to think if this was our last conversation, how much heart do we want to put in it? And why would I leave anything out? And why would you? And I feel that the, you know, my gratitude, my love, the, the history of our connection is fully present, enhanced by the thought that, I don't know. I mean, will we see each other again? I hope so, but something could happen. So that's the die before you die. And you know, I take the example of uh, Steve Jobs, uh, because he had plenty of time to consider his mortality. And he started doing that before his illness was diagnosed. And that, that had a very significant impact in his life. He said many times that death is the best invention to not get complacent. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, and part of, I think, the, the, the tie between this is uh, being committed in the thing you're doing to realize that this is your life and your work is meaningful. Yes. Right? Like, the, the key thing is, I am here and I am here because I want to be in this thing I'm doing. And exactly. you should be moving towards that. Yes. And this is, I think, you know, part of why I think the paradigm shift of meaning revolution is to say, how do individuals come together in a group where we feel happy and collected as part of that group, not denying our individuality, but feeling that the group celebrates our, 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 our community as we are individuals. Exactly. Well, I, the, I think the beauty of LinkedIn or other of the companies in the Valley is that They've created a platform. It's not the content. It's the platform that allows the expression of multiple individualities in concert. And I see that every company could be that. Every company could be a platform where people come and express their life energy. I, I am I'm infinitely grateful. I mean, I, I, I feel LinkedIn was an, an extraordinary platform for me to express my life mission, to write this book, to put videos and and it's so individual i also feel it contributed to, to the community and i got a lot of care and camaraderie back but it's i mean i can only imagine i hope you feel tremendously proud to have created this opportunity for people to be themselves but bigger it, it's like you don't have to give up yourself on the contrary I like to blow it up from inside. It just gets so big that you, you can't distinguish where's the boundary. Everybody is part of the self and the, the spirit of care and community, but it feels at the same time totally individual. It never feels like a trade of, like, I, oh, can I be myself and yet be accepted by you? It's like being myself, I become you. Yeah. I mean, I like your language a lot more than the language um, that I used earlier in the startup review, but I also, it's the eye to the we. Yes. Life is a team sport, not an individual sport. But I think that the axis of that co uh, collection being the shared meaning, the, the shared purpose. I mean, this is actually one of the also oxymorons of what is servant leadership, which is another thing it seems that it's oddly put together, but it's in service to the mission. Exactly. That's one of the things I, I try to say in the book, because I, I have a disagreement with the people who say servant leadership is about serving the people. I don't like it either when somebody encompasses, our biggest contribution is we create all these jobs. It's like, I mean, not LinkedIn, because we create jobs outside, but yes. it would be like, look, we LinkedIn, LinkedIn has 10,000 employees. I mean, we're great. We 10,000 families that are getting, or I don't know, Exxon could say we have 200,000 families that are getting. But that's not the contribution of a company. The contribution of a company, it's, it's service to the outside world. It would be like, a doctor saying, look, I, I, I have this huge office. I'm very successful. This is my biggest. No, no it's, it's your patience. It's not what you do. Or a drug dealer saying, we've got a great organization. We're employing thousands of people exactly. delivering yeah, drugs yeah. around the world. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I, and people feel, usually people feel proud of what they do. And that, going back to the Navy SEALs, imagine a commander saying, my, my priority, my absolute priority is you're never going to get hurt. 
no matter what, I'm going to take care of you, and you know, I can guarantee we're going to be safe, and you know, no way I'm going to accept any mission that will put any of my soldiers at risk. It's like, what? I mean, <laughs> you, th th that's not the point. It's like, I will not ask you to do anything I wouldn't do first, and I'm going to put myself in harm's way with you, and if anything happens, we'll bring you home dead or alive. Yep. But you are going to be in danger, and some of us will die. Do you still want to come? But that, that, that servant leadership serving the mission rather than, oh, we're going to make it nice and cozy for everybody. That, that's just. By the way, I had a fascinating conversation a couple weeks back with one of the um, SEAL Team 6 former trainers. And Delta Force and SEAL Team train differently. So Delta Force trains as individuals primarily, and SEAL trains as, as groups. And it's fascinating what the analysis of different kinds of missions yes. are better for each group. Yes. Like which missions you do for them. It's, it was a, it was a, sometime we'll go into that kind of long, fascinating conversation, but it was really, I had never paid that much attention to it, and I was suddenly like, oh, of course, these guys have been thinking about this for, you know, a hundred years, going, how do we get this right? How do we, how do we perform as a team? How do we get individual performance high? But this is, this is something, uh, there's something very profound in what you just said, which is most people think of collaboration as we're friends. I help you, you help me, and then we collaborate. That's wrong. You can be an individual performer, never see anybody, and yet be totally in collaboration with everybody else. So let's just say a Delta Force operator. Yes. They're like a sniper, yes. and they're out there. They're alone. Nobody's helping them. They're not helping anybody, and yet they are totally collaborating with the team. This, this is very common in companies where people say, oh, help me. It's, no, no, no. When you're mission-driven, your relationships are all triangular. They're not, we don't need to be friends. Yeah. Like, we can, we can be friends, yeah. but it's not necessary. You may like, you know, some type of movies, I another, you may like drinking, I don't like it, or whatever, but that's not, we're not buddies. We are committed to the same mission, and we work together. That completely changes the dynamics of every conversation about how are we going to work together for the mission, or work separately for the mission, but even when we work separately, we're still collaborating. Yes. And this is probably a good place to talk about this other, uh, the last of the, um, of the kind of oxymoron phrases that I picked up from the book, uh, superconscious capitalism. Yes. Well, um, unconscious capitalism is Adam Smith. Adam Smith has a famous statement where he says, um, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher or the brewer or the baker that we get our sustenance, but their own self-interest, something like that. And then he says, but as an invisible hand, they are guided to pursue a purpose that they didn't have in mind, which is the contribution to society. So Adam Smith is saying, as long as you respect people's property rights and you don't uh, transgress their, uh, their life, their liberty, and their property, any voluntary transaction is going to help. Because the fact that it's voluntary means everybody's finding it in their interest to participate. So if there's an opt-out possibility, then people, if they participate, means they want to do it. So I say, even in the case of unconscious capitalism, it's still a reasonably good thing. But why not do it on purpose? <laughs> so why not do it? Yeah, I like to help other people. And, uh, and that's what I would call conscious capitalism. So I get an extra value of contributing to humanity or doing something. And you know, in our conversations, I have to say, you know, in all the years I know you, I, I never heard you say anything about the business success. I mean, I'm just reflecting. It was like, yeah, the business success is a means to an end, which is the mission. And that's tremendously inspiring. And paradoxically, that's how you succeed. But that is still, I think there's room for more. There's something in the spiritual traditions about being super conscious, which is not love thy brother as thyself but realize that you and your brother are the self, where the self is not personal. Selfhood, uh, in a sense that we could say, the body doesn't host the mind, but the body is in the mind. So there's a, there's a, a, a metaphysical perspective where there's a space in which Every, everything in reality arises, but it's like a dream. You, know, you can have multiple characters in the dream, but it's all made of the dream stuff, if you want to call it like that. So it's called transcendental idealism. So from a transcendental idealistic standpoint, uh, you and I are characters, and everybody here, we're all characters in this dream of, 
transcendent consciousness. Mm -hmm. I don't want to use the G word, but you can, you can think of uh, like the, the void out of which everything arises, like a supercharged energetic field that gives rise to particles, and then they disappear in the field. So I know that sounds a little out there, but, um, and it is out there, <laughs> but the truth is it's the most fundamental experience every person has. The, the world as objects is an inference. The only thing we have is our experience as, as arising in consciousness. And when you see that, if you start thinking, well, what I tried to develop in the last chapter is this idea that what kind of capitalism would emerge beyond conscious, like I want to help you and I want to do good in the world, if you started seeing the meaning of our existence has something to do with the realization of who we really are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. And actually, one of the things that I also love about your book is I think that it's a pity that we've, uh, um, we underuse the term heroism and being a hero um, because we tend to kind of implicitly think it's like, you know, the, the soldier who holds back the barbarian horde and that's, that's the only point of heroism. And actually, in fact, it was, I think it was a lot of heroism is possible in actually everyday life. Um, so why don't you go a little bit into the heroism yes. that you're describing in the book? Yeah, I, 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 certainly the image of the soldier holding back the barbarians is um, bad, but I, I think there's something even worse, which is the superheroes, the comic book superheroes, which give us the impression that you have to have superpowers to be a hero. And then I say, well, what can I do? You know, I'm not Superman, I'm not Batman, I, you know, I can run like Flash. Uh, I guess I watch the movies, or I'm not Luke Skywalker, you know, I'm not a Jedi, so what can I do? But that, that's, that's a mistake. That's a huge lie that destroys the chance to be an everyday hero. For me, heroism is moral. Heroism is stand, to stand up for what you believe, to tell the truth, to care for others, to express your values, to say something when you see something that's wrong, to not deceive other people, to live with your heart open, to show your vulnerability. And that happens all the time, every minute. I mean, every minute you have a choice. Will you tell the truth or will you pretend? Will you listen to someone or will you try to overwhelm them with your argument? Will you try to understand or will you try to convince? And that, that, that for me is heroism, is the, is the courage to say, you know, I'm not sure. So help me understand, why, why are you saying something different than me? As opposed to, if you say something different than me, you're my enemy, and I'm going to shut you down. That, is, that, that takes all the superpowers in the heart, and they are, but they're not physical. So, so this illusion that, oh, heroism is bad, I think it makes people live mediocre lives. Yeah. Our lives are mythical. They can be epic every day. I mean, everything. Yeah, but well, this is precisely the thing, which is, actually think about the ways in which you can be a hero because actually, in fact, just about everyone can, yes. you know, maybe everyone, every day in the way you're doing it. And it's not an egoism story. It's a in-service to meaning. Like, there's one of the parallels in business. People frequently say, act like an owner. And it's true. It's a good thing to do. There's a bunch of different, both economist theory and everything else. But also part of that is act like an owner of the mission. Yeah. Right? Act like an owner. Like, it doesn't mean, oh, I have to have a leader to actually be following a mission. Like, actually, in fact, everyone can say, I embody this mission, and I'm going to help us embody this mission. I don't need to wait for instruction. Well, I, I, I want to just share a story about uh, Reed with you, because uh, before I joined LinkedIn, so I had this conversation with Jeff, and before I joined, I wanted to meet Reed, who is the founder, and see, OK, well, how is this guy? And we went to have sushi. And I, you know, we had a nice conversation, but I had a poignant question. Um, I said, w wh why didn't you do like Zuck, that uh, hired Jeff as a COO, like, Sher like Sherry was hired as a COO of Facebook instead of a CEO? Why did you hire Jeff? And Reed's answer was, well, because I trust Jeff to fulfill our mission with more competency than I can. He, he's more suitable to run a large organization than I could, so um, he's like my late stage co-founder. I was like, oh my God, this, this guy is really good. This guy, <laughs> I mean, I knew he was good, but not that good. <laughs> it was a bit of a shock. <laughs> no, no, but it really, it was, I, I, was, I, was, I was stunned because I thought 
in that moment, I thought, well, I don't, I don't have LinkedIn as an asset, but, but I have me as an asset. That, you know, I, if you say, oh, well, you, know, you can't do great things, Fred, because you don't have a big company that you founded and all that. But as Mother Teresa said, not everybody can do great things, but everybody can do small things with great love. And I said, well, I, I, have, I have an asset too, which is 100% of my asset, which is my life. And I, and I realized, well, I trust Jeff to run my life, at least my work life, better than I can run it myself in the service of my mission. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hire Jeff as my CEO, just like a read hire Jeff or LinkedIn hire Jeff as its CEO. And I'll give him authority to guide me on how to fulfill my mission. And that this, this, this just changed completely, you know, between Jeff telling me one day, you know, don't follow me, follow the mission, and Reed telling me, well, you know, I trust Jeff to run my asset. It was, I was completely sold. And I think those two things changed my life. I, I was not suitable for employment uh, before <laughs> these two things. No, I, I was just too wild. I mean, I, I had my own company, and uh, yeah, people could work with me. I didn't have any employee. I didn't want any employees either. And it's, it's really changed my philosophy where I also feel now able to have employees. Like if people ever worked for me again, I, would, I think I would treat them in a very different way. I would take more responsibility for guiding them because I wouldn't feel that I'm owning them. Whereas before, it, it cuts both ways. If I feel owned, I also feel like I would own other people and then I don't want big organization or that. I was always very reluctant. And now I feel less worried about Working, working for someone or serving under someone's guidance, serving the mission. And I also feel less awkward about claiming the authority to guide someone mm -hmm. because I don't feel that I would own them. And just imagine what the business world would be like if people work with that level of integrity and honor. And, and we would see it in movies and say, oh, that's because they are, you know, they're fighting you know, a, 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 a war in another galaxy. It's like, no, this happens now. I mean, if, if you trust your manager to guide you, then it's a completely different world than if you're protecting yourself because you think your manager wants to own you. Yep, 100%. In about a couple of minutes, we're going to do questions. There's uh, mics you can line up at. Let's take this kind of the, the spiritual and meaningful conversation down to a little bit of pragmatics. If you're an individual, like say, you know, it could be a... Uh, a, a manager or an individual contributor, mm -hmm. and you're saying, I want to kind of live the meaning revolution. What are the questions to ask? What are the things to do to, to orient your life in that direction? Well, at first, I would say it's not a question, but a leap of faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean this in the technical Kierkegaardian sense, the, the, the philosopher that, that had this, um, this idea that the only way to change your life is to take a leap of faith because you can't be guaranteed. And there are two equally valid truths. And you have to choose one. And depending on which one you choose, your life will go one way or the other. The one valid truth is that things are happening to me. And it's true. A lot of things are happening to me and to all of us. And the majority of life is things happening to us. The other side of this equation is that I'm choosing how to respond and I'm participating in the dance of life. So nothing happens to me. Life, in a sense, is playing chess with me. And life moves, and I move, and life moves, and I move. But we are in this dance or in this game. And I call that the absolute ownership of your ability to respond. That's a leap of faith. Because if someone says, well, wait a minute, uh, you know, the, the, all these things happen to me, it's true. So, so you can't argue about that. I'm not arguing that it's not true. I'm saying that a life will shape in a very different form if you see it from the perspective of what I call the victim, a victim of circumstances, or a crafter of destiny, where you say, life is giving me raw material. Now I have to create something with that. And it's amazing how much you can create with things that look pretty poor or pretty negative, but some of the most important uh, realizations people have in life are paved by a scary experience at the beginning. So I don't know if any, you think about something really, really important you learned that changed your life. I guarantee that the early part of that experience was not something you would choose. Yeah. I mean, Joseph Campbell, when he, when he talks about the hero's journey, says the hero is always 
goes into the journey kicking and screaming, trying to get back. Like Moses saying, why me? I'm a stutterer. Okay, God is saying, go talk to Pharaoh. It's like, oh, me? Can you send that guy? <laughs> I, I don't want to go. So that, that, that's how you get meaning. Like, look, this, is, this life is the opportunity I have, whatever I means, this experience of I-ness has embodied to manifest something. And what am I going to do? Right now, this I amness is asking what's the way in which we express ourselves. So that, that's for sure, I would say, the absolute beginning of the journey. Once you do that, that leap, now you'll be in your own hero's journey. I don't know what happens next, but it's going to be super exciting. Well, and that's like the, the die before you die, because similarly to that kind of uh, terror or anxiety, Death feels with that. That's also the thing that we respond to yes. in order to be meaningful or yes. heroic. Exactly, exactly. Because the, you, you know once you start this journey, something you is going to die. So there, there's something that can't, you can't take with you in the journey. So uh, last question for me before we get to the microphone, although I, if I see a couple people, but if, if we end up with uh, more time, I will ask more questions. Um, what are some of the ways that you can, one of the things I think people frequently don't realize about what they can do as an individual is that just like you can train yourself to think better, train yourself to perform better, train yourself to be more organized, uh, train yourself to analyze problems better, you can also train yourself to be kind of spiritually better and collaboratively better and meaningfully better. What are some of those techniques that and, and partially leading you towards meditation and that kind yes. of thing. But what are, what are some of those techniques that you think about? Here is ways that you that you can practice and train yourself to be better in these kind of spiritual dimensions. Uh, the first technique is to seriously doubt yourself. Seriously, like whatever you think is right, is like very suspicious, because we we are genetically engineered to want the wrong things, quite literally. I mean, sometimes I think, you know, why the hell are we cursed liking sugar? You know, sugar is not good for you. So why is it that every child would prefer to have chocolate ice cream than kale salad? <laughs> you, know, you, don't, you don't have to teach a child to, to, to eat chocolate. It, it's just like, or French fries. You know, yeah. this is so good. But they're, they're so good, but they are, they're deadly. And it's like, well, why, why didn't I like carrots instead of donuts? Yes. Well, this, this, this is a genetic engineering problem because through evolution, we are designed to get to puberty, procreate, and die quickly. They were not designed to have meaning in our lives, to be happy, to connect to others, none, none, nothing like that. We're, we're designed to just die quickly after we, <laughs> the genes, we're like robots that are useless. It's like, you know, you, 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 get, on a, you get in this robot car, until, or you ride this horse until it dies, and then you jump in the other horse, or you jump first, and then it dies, and so on. And the genes use us. No, but this is, this is serious evolutionary biology. I'm, I'm, I'm saying it in a caricaturesque way, but this is, this is pretty serious. So if you realize that that's the case, then you should be highly suspicious of anything that tastes good to you. I'm not saying that everything that tastes good is bad, but it's a good assumption to test. I mean, I, I, there are more things, you know, whatever, like alcohol tastes great. I mean, being intoxicated is fantastic. Or, <laughs> sorry, no, I never inhaled, but uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I never inhaled the alcohol. That's what I mean. I inhaled other things. So <laughs> anything that, that, that really clicks with this system of quick reward is highly suspicious. So yelling at someone feels so good. Like, you know, yelling and screaming at someone and ha seeing them cower, it feels like, whoa, I'm, I'm big, I'm, I'm powerful. I say, oh, that's dangerous. Anything that tastes like this is dangerous. So if you realize that, you say, I need, I need to debug this system. This system is full of bugs. There are all these things that are going to encourage me to do the right thing for the genes, but the wrong thing for my life. And when, when you get there, you need a debugging mode. And the debugging mode is the practice. It's like, stop. Stop and objectify your temptation. And look at it and understand it. Don't, don't judge it. No, it's not like, oh, bad, bad, bad. Don't look at that. Bad, bad, bad dog. You know, get out of the couch. <laughs> don't, no, no. But it's like, interesting. Hmm. I, I call this the Mr. Spock mode. 
<laughs> Mr. Spock from, from Star Trek. Uh -huh. Fascinating. Wow, I just want to kill this person just because they disagree with me. They, they said they found a mistake in my PowerPoint, and now I just want to kill them. It, <laughs> I, maybe it's because they did it in front of my boss, so I want to kill them in front of my boss. <laughs> And you say, well, no, you can't do that. You have to be a Vulcan to do that. No, you don't have to be a Vulcan. That's a human capability. But you have to learn to access that debugging mode of the human mind. And that debugging mode is meditation. It's when you, you have to practice doing that when you're not in front of your boss, when you don't want to kill the person, when you're not subject to all that. Because after breathing five minutes, you will be there. But you will be there while you're sitting, while you're alone, while you're quiet. And then you can manage it. If it happens and you have never practiced, it will overwhelm you. It's like being drunk. But if you are not drunk, if you are going slowly, it's like desensitization. You know, when people have fear of spiders, well, the first thing is just think of a spider. Ah! I mean, just go crazy. Well, after a few days that you think of a spider, then like now open your eyes. I'm going to have an image in a in a piece of paper of the spider 20 feet away from you. And it's like ooh, and then well, at some point you can have a spider on your hand. You you desensitize yourself where that happens. So, learning to handle the impulses that are going to derail your life through this practice of disciplined consideration and observation in non-judgmental mode is, I, mean, I, I don't know any other way. This, this is the, like the most fundamental practice for everything that follows. 100%. Uh, well, actually, uh, there's a mic. So go uh, stand at the mic if you can when you raise your hand. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> great. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> oh, that's great. OK. Um, we have a question on the stream I thought we'd start with. Um, what is your advice to those not in leadership positions um, or people managers who want to develop their leadership skills and start a career path towards those leadership positions? Great. So first, I'd say uh, Mu. Mu is a Japanese word for I unask your question. Uh, there's a famous uh, Zen koan that is like, uh, does a dog have Buddha nature? And the answer is Mu. No. I mean, I, the question is a presupposition. So I'll give you a good question for a Mu. A good question for a Mu is, are you still beating your wife when you get drunk? The answer is Mu. I unask your question because there's a presupposition that I used to beat my wife when I got drunk, and that's wrong. There's no, I never did that. So there's something there, and the, the Mu part of the question is leadership positions. There are no leadership positions. That's a complete mistake. I understand why people say that, but they're only authority positions. So let me define leadership, and we'll see that there is no leadership position. Leadership, or leading, is eliciting the internal commitment of others to pursue a mission. So you cannot do that from a position. So if you're going to inspire people to commit to a mission, what position do you need to do that? None. I mean, every, every one and none of them, because this is about moral authority, is not about formal authority. So the belief that you can exercise leadership only when you have formal authority is a complete non-starter. I mean, that, that, that you're dead on arrival to leadership. The, the question of leadership is, how can you inspire anyone? I mean, you can inspire your boss, uh, uh, apparently. Or you can inspire your colleagues, you can inspire your children, you can inspire your spouse, you can inspire your friends. So just forget about this leadership position and start asking, how can I lead? And lead is inspiring people. I, I, I use the example of my kids. Being a boss, I want my kids to read, and I threaten them. You don't read, you don't watch TV, or you don't watch, you play with your devices. As a leader, I want my children to want to read. That's, that's, a, that's a different question. I, I, I can't threaten them to want to read. I have to find a way to inspire them. And this is true everywhere. So I would say, you know, respectfully, I and ask the question because waiting for an authority position before you inspire people, it's a sure way to waste your life. Great, thank you. Next. Thank you both for being here. I want to tell everyone that uh, I am filled with fear, and we are all filled with fear. Uh, I, I'm trying to be conscious of the fear that I feel like all the time, every moment. And when I look at the two of you sitting there, you strike me as people who, you know, 
Don't seem to be afraid of sitting there and telling the world what you think. And especially Fred, I want to ask uh, you, you know, um, teach us how to look at fear in the eye. Teach us how to, you know, let go of it. Mm. Well, first, uh, I want to honor your declaration and the question, the, the, the tone and the respect is, is beautiful. And you standing up and you know, challenging the fear and showing up and asking this question is, uh, is the best answer. I mean, I, because you don't need to overcome your fear to, to show up and tell the truth and be present. You just need to not let it dominate you. So I, I say, I defer, when you were speaking, I said, why am I not afraid? I, I swear, I mean, it's a little embarrassing, but I said, because Reed is my friend. And I'm here with a friend, and it's like, you know, I, we've had so many conversations, and it's just like inviting you to eavesdrop on, on the conversations that we have. Yep. And it's like, oh, great. I mean, it's, it's fun, it's exciting. I have no idea what he's going to ask, but, but I know he cares, and I, I feel this. So choosing a community of people that will, will go with you in that journey is so important. I, I don't know how to do it alone. So I feel very blessed that I've had friends along the path. And uh, you know, in, the, in Buddhism, you have these three jewels, which is the Buddha, the, the image of the exemplar, the Dharma, which is the teaching, the truth. But the third jewel is always the Sangha, the community. And the possibility of going into the, um, you know, the, this, this space of compression with, with friends when you are going to go into uh, an alchemical, uh, how do you call the place where the reaction happens? It's the, like a cauldron. Catalyst. Uh... No, it's the space. That, that when you put everything in the pot and it boils and, anyway, you, you're going to go cook with other people that love you and you love. The cooking is not painful at all. It's like joyful. So I would say these three jewels is having a good exemplar, people that uh, you can look up to, and not superheroes, but, but real human beings that, that will inspire you to go on the path. Then find some truth, some, some real good doctrine that will help you grow, because you don't have to learn everything alone. But the most important is the community. That's how I... Thank you. Thank, thank you thank very you. much. Well, th thank you for, be, uh, for joining us. So I have, I'm a big fan of, of Fred. So I have a question about um, your childhood, especially the era where like the military coup has taken over like Argentina. Do you believe that those generals might have bad meanings or maybe that meaning wasn't executed properly? Because uh, there are similar situations happen in the world that people claim or they do intend to have good meanings, but it's end up to become kind of disaster to whoever, whoever they claim to help. Yes. There are very few people that in real life will say, I'm evil. It just doesn't happen. Everybody thinks they're doing a good thing. So the generals, like, I mean, I tell them, I didn't tell the whole story in conscious business because there's a part of the story that was so embarrassing, so scary to me that I couldn't, I couldn't write. Um, I wrote it here. This book is like, I'm a little, like, I don't know if less afraid, but I just don't care. And my career is over now, so I can tell it. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, no, but, it, but it, it is, I don't want to speak about the generals, I'll speak about myself. I thought I was doing a good thing by not participating, like expressing my, my judgment and being away. But you know, when I saw the mothers of Plaza de Mayo that were walking, asking for their children, I ran away. I was not a hero. I was, I was, I was very scared because people would disappear for joining them. So I didn't say anything. And I discovered that very painfully when I, um, when I taught a seminar in Germany and someone asked me coaching for coaching because he was the son of a concentration camp guard. Now, I'm Jewish. So now this guy is asking me to work with him about his guilt because his dad is a concentration camp um, guard. I'm like, 
what do I do? And, and then I realized that I had judged all these good Germans all my life, saying, oh, they watched the Jews go into the cattle carts, nobody did anything, and, and I had all these judgments, because I was, I was pure, I was righteous, I was the, the good guy, and they were the, the evil ones that thought of themselves as good. And then I had this oh shit moment, like a real oh shit moment. And I said, I was the good Argentinian. I did exactly the same thing when they were taking people in front of me. I literally saw people being put in green Ford Falcons and disappeared. I mean, not there, but they took them and they never show up again. So I, I was like, oh my God, I've been judging all these Germans, absolutely not understanding the terror that it must have been. I mean, Nazi Germany was worse than Argentina. But I knew my terror, and I excused myself. So it's like, oh, wait a minute. I'm using a completely different bar to measure myself or measure the others. For me, it's OK. You know, I'm just protecting myself. They, they are the sons of bitches, evil, that didn't do anything when they were taking my people. I said, wait a minute. That's not ethical. That's not fair. So I, when, when, when Reed asked me about the meditation, I think that's, that's part of what feels good, to feel self-righteous, to feel we are the good ones. And that's very, 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 very dangerous. So that's why I think freedom of expression, the, the respect for other people's ideas, the, the civil dialogue about let, let's check one another in a friendly manner. So like what, what is true? What is beautiful? What is just in this situation? Um, that, uh, it's the only guarantee we have to at least not err too far off the mark. Because when any person is left alone, we start becoming delirious. We start having our own ideas. And then if we feed upon itself on the self-righteousness, we can end up you know, creating absolute holocausts over and over again. But the people that are leading this holocaust, they think they're doing the right thing. They're protecting their people. I mean, I'm sure you ask any person so-called evil, what are they doing? And they'll tell you a good story. So. Um, I learned that the hard way by realizing, I mean, I didn't do anything, but not speaking up, I consider something shameful. I wouldn't do that again. But I did it, and I didn't know that I was doing it until 10 years later. And the amplification, I'd say, upon Fred's uh, great and beautiful statement is that you, by asking yourself the hard questions, you say, uh, look, is my mission really to reduce suffering and to help uh, other people, inclusive of myself, uh, get to their full potential or not. And really thinking about it. Meditation allows you to calmly think about that. And so I do think there are people who have bad missions and people who have good missions. And that, but that's part of how you get to that answer to that question. Um, next question. Thank you. All right, thank you again for the talk. That was awesome. Um, I've thought a lot, a lot about these types of issues myself. So. Uh, kind of piggybacking off the last question, one of the difficulties I see with this type of philosophy is that, you know, we can all be focusing towards the mission, and the broader goals and all that, but it seems to me that it doesn't take many bad apples to spoil the bunch. Like once you have one person who's trying to game the system and turns it into a competition and I'm just going to go for it anyway, um, it becomes very tempting to fight fire with fire. And not just in a business sense, but in society today, it seems like, uh, everywhere, both sides, all the sides. People are circling the wagons tighter, becoming more ideologically polarized, judging other people, um, resorting to just uh, self-righteousness, like you said, and it can seem almost incomprehensibly challenging to exemplify the moral principles you've stated in the face of these difficulties and not give way and say that, well, they're doing it, so we need to fight back in the same way. So how do you deal with this type of situation? And um, unfortunately, I think because of time, this will be the last answer. Uh, Fred is doing a book signing afterwards and undoubtedly would chat a little bit as he's doing that. Um, but why don't we answer this question and then we will, we will wrap up. Well, uh, I, I don't think it's incomprehensibly difficult. I think it's incomprehensibly difficult to succeed in changing the pattern. But it's actually very simple to exemplify the disruption of the pattern. Because when everybody's so crazy, just not being crazy, just bringing a word of sanity 
Now, will they listen to you? Will you succeed? Probably not. I, so I agree, it's daunting. But what's daunting is success. Mm. Principles are not daunting. So you just do it. So you, 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 you listen, you try to respect people, you exclude yourself from the conversation if it's impossible, but you don't make it worse. And the paradox is that what seems like oh shit becomes oh fertilizer. <laughs> because that is the moment. You know, in the moment of where everybody's screaming, just one person holding gracefully their poise will, will, will just change everything. But not change everything because everybody else will follow, but it, it just stops this absolute craziness that seems to overtake everyone. And it proves to everybody else that it's possible. So again, very humbly, I'm saying it's possible to not go along with the craziness. I'm not saying it's possible to stop or revert the craziness. But then again, that, that's what Krishna taught Arjuna, the general in the Bhagavad Gita. It's like, you know, you can go and fight your war, do your dharma, like do your duty, express everything as a sacrifice to me. But that doesn't mean you're going to win. So don't count on winning, count on being proud of doing everything as a sacrifice to your higher values. So if you put that as the north in your moral compass, you, you can do that. I mean, you're doing this now, we're doing it now, and if somebody stood and screamed, I don't know what we would do, it would be like, oh, this is, this is really bad. I, I, I mean, I'm sure it would take some measure, but it's, it's the attitude of no matter what happens, I can express my value in this moment in a truthful way. So thank you for asking. So um, leaders have no followers. Books do have readers. I recommend the, t the book to you. Uh, and uh, thank you all, including the folks streaming, uh, for being here. You, I think you uh, understand why I think Fred is uh, special on these things. And the, I will again close with the high priest of capitalism. He's doing a book signing here. And thank you. Thank you very much.